This video will be the unboxing, assembly, and first print of the JAO S8 Plus released and distributed by Sunlu. And here we go. Welcome back, folks. Sitting next to me, I have the JO S8 Plus distributed by Sunlu. Does that necessarily mean this is a Sunlu S8 Plus? Well, quite honestly, I'm not sure. It appears so. I only own the JO version, but they are released by the same brand. I've looked at pictures online, and everything appears to be the same. Now, there have been iterative differences, the extruder, the hot end, things like that, that seem to have changed with each release and not necessarily based on J.O. brand or Sunlu brand. So, if you have the opportunity to pick up a J.O. S8 Plus or a Sunlu S8 Plus, this video should apply to both. So, this channel is very much about budget printing. Most of my videos before this have dealt with the Voxel Abakia, a printer that's extremely inexpensive that goes above and beyond its cost bracket. Now, that printer comes with what I would call a standard size or de facto size build volume. 220 by 220 by 250. It's excellent. It gets most of your prints done. Most models are designed with that size or around about that size in mind. So if they are larger, they'll get sliced and chopped into smaller versions. So you can build them piece by piece and then assemble them. But what happens when you want to print something in a single piece that's larger than that print volume? Well. It's going to get larger on your cost base because you're going to have to open your wallet and shell out a decent amount of cash. Big print volume, big price tag. Well, except for this model. Now, this model was released a little while ago, and it originally went by the name Sunlu S8. Now, at that time, the price tag was between $250, I believe, and $300, somewhere thereabouts. Since then, it's been iterated upon, improved upon, and the price has even came down. Can you believe that? And currently, there appears to be flash sales for this thing on Amazon. I was able to purchase this unit on Amazon for $189.99. Now, what do you get for that price? Well, you get a very big build surface. You get 310 by 310 by 400. That is absurd. For that price, to get that sort of volume is unheard of. So, what's wrong with this machine? How could I get so much for so little? Well, I wanted to find out. I wanted to see if I could print those big models in one piece that I've been trying to do. So I shelled out a little bit of cash. It arrived to the house. We assembled it. We unboxed it. We did it in the reverse order, of course. And then we threw some prints at it. And let's see what happened. Here's the unboxing of the JAO S8 Plus and then the assembly. Now, the assembly can take about 10 minutes if you really wanted it to, but you'd be doing yourself a disservice. You should always take your time putting these together and make sure everything is put together properly including the stuff that is already put together from the factory eccentric nuts everything's tightened down so here is what comes in the package we have an instruction booklet single page very simple uh, power cord then we have the two-part filament holder then there's a bag with a usb cable a glue stick some cable ties then we have a bag with a spatula a flush cutter some the, the screws we need as well as the extruder arm that we have to put on after that we have the filament uh, that comes with the machine and then we're ready to shuck this thing out of the box. And there it is, all already mostly put together and cable tied together. And that's what it looks like coming out of the box. Uh, pretty well packaged. Nothing was banged, dented, or mistreated. First thing we're going to do is we put these two little threaded spacers in the bottom of the Z-axis rail. There's white marks as to where we're supposed to place these things. We do one on each side. And this is going to hold a T-bracket from the base of the printer to the Z-axis rails. After that, we put the extruder arm on, red sheath, the screw goes into that, and then we put that into the arm. After that, we mount the arm to the extruder. Looking back, I would do this after my Z-axis was mounted. I don't know why they actually or tell you to do it in this step. It doesn't seem necessary. I would do it once you have the machine actually upright. So after the arm is put on, we're going to put the spring on. Here's the spring. We put that little sheath inside the spring. That's what helps tension it down with the screw that's in the extruder. You put that onto the arm between the tensioner arm and the actual extruder, and then you tighten down that screw more. You're going to want to put some pressure on the arm as you're tightening that screw down. And then that's the tension 
of the spring. That's what's going to put tension on your actual extruder arm. We clip our cable ties to release the Z-axis rail from the printer base, and then we're going to mount that base. And the first thing we want to do is there's like a plastic T on the base that connects it to the Z-axis rails. Put the screws in there lightly. Don't tighten them down yet. We're going to want to tighten the base to the lower portion of the rails first. So that's just, I'm putting those screws in there just to get them in. Then I like to use the packaging materials to kind of handle this stuff and mount it. So that's what I'm doing. I put the printer on the box and I keep the one side hung over so I can access the screws underneath. Now I have to say I was impressed by the wiring. There's even a, a sticker under there that makes that tells you to, to not snag any wires while you're tightening and it's all routed very nicely and uh, neatly. So this is me putting the the M5 by 25, I believe, screws into the uprights. After I was done with that, I can then fully tighten down those T brackets. After that, the assembly is kind of done. So now this is when I go over the printer, I check everything, and I do my upgrades. Now, the thing I upgrade on printers like these are the springs and the Bowden tube. So I take off the glass build plate in preparation of upgrading the springs. And at this point, I check that build plate. I check the eccentric nuts for wobble, and I do any adjustments necessary. Make sure the belts are all appropriate. After that, I check my motors. I check my Z-axis motor, I check my extruder motor. If they're loose, I tighten them. I check the Z-rods, which I'm doing here. I actually noticed my extruder motor was loose, so I tightened it up. And while I was doing that, I also noticed my Z-rods were ungreased. And you want those to be greased up. They're constantly under mechanical tension. So this is me. This is the lube I use. Uh, it's a dry lube, it's a Teflon lube. It's better than a goopy lube that you would normally see because it doesn't take as many particulates out of the air. So I'm spraying down my Z-rod. I didn't want to take it fully off. That would be the proper way to do it. I just didn't feel like doing it. After that, I check my hot end. I take the shroud off. I wanted to take a look at it. It's a fat boy. It's this fat red extruder. But then I get to removing my Bowden tube. Now, regardless if you're going to do this step or not, you want to make sure those pneumatic couplers that are on the cold end of that extruder and then to the hot end, you want to make sure those are tight and you want to make sure the Bowden tube is snug in those. I also took this opportunity to adjust the Z-axis eccentric nuts on both sides of my gantry. Then a really good uh, practice to use when you're seating that Bowden tube, you tighten your pneumatic coupler all the way down, loosen it one, t uh, one turn, sink the Bowden tube in, and then tighten that pneumatic coupler, and it pulls down that Bowden tube even more. So what we saw there was the upgraded springs that I installed. Those are the yellow springs. And this is just me reseating that glass bed on with the, pro with the springs and then adjusting my knobs. And what I do is I adjust the springs down to about, I guesstimate, 80% tightness. You want to make sure they're definitely tight. You don't want to leave them loose, so you give yourself more leverage when you're bed leveling. Then I ran through there. I re-cable tied down my Bowden tube, made everything nice. So right here, what I'm going to do is adjust the uh, Z end stop. I put my glass bed on so I know the proper level. I use the couplers on the, uh, the Z rods on the stepper motors to lower the gantry to just above my glass bed. Then I loosen my Z end stop. I raise it so that it's activated at that level, and then I tighten up. This just helps you bed level. This way, the Z end stop out of the factory could be a little high, could be a little low, and it crashes into your bed. You don't want that, obviously. But this means that when the Z end stop first auto homes, it'll be just above my glass build plate and I have a better shot at leveling it. So this is me just tightening that back up. Make sure you take that uh, protective coating off your heated bed. You do not want to start the, the machine with that thing still on it. The glass bed goes on. The binder clips go on after that. Then we mount the filament spool holder. We're done with the assembly. We make sure the voltage is correct for me, 115 in my area, and then we're ready to start the printer. So after our machine has been put together, we make sure we have the correct voltage chosen. We plug it in, we turn it on. The first thing we do is auto home, which is what you're seeing here. Just make sure all our end stops work, make sure everything's rolling properly, all the stepper motors are doing their thing. And the first thing I did was I looked at this auto bed leveling system, and what it does is it is it brings the nozzle into four different quadrants and on the LCD screen you you click through the rotary knob and it moves it to each quadrant. Also, while at that quadrant, you can adjust the Z offset to get the nozzle closer to the bed to make it easier to level. So then you can 
adjust your rotary knobs underneath the bed and level it. And you can do that for each different corner. That Z offset doesn't carry over to prints or anything like that. It just lets you level your bed easier with those four different quadrants. Pretty cool. After the fourth one, though, it does go back to the auto home, and you'd have to start over uh, to do it more than one time. The next thing I did was I made sure my x-axis gantry was leveled from left to right. So I took a 20 millimeter shim and I put it under each of the sides of the gantry and I made sure that they were snug on both sides. Uh, mine was actually perfect. I didn't have to do any adjustment, but if you do have to do an adjustment, what you need to do is disable the steppers through the LCD screen. You'll hold the stepper you don't want to adjust and then you will adjust the coupler on the other stepper, uh, stepper motor. You rotate it one way to bring the gantry up and you rotate the other way to bring it down. So you adjust it appropriately so that that shim is tight on both sides equally. Um, after that, it's on to bed leveling. I did it manually here. I didn't use the auto bed leveling system because I wasn't used to it quite yet. I just went to all four corners. I went around, I don't know, five or six times, made sure my bed was level. After that, we calibrated our E-steps. I have a video on that, but basically loaded the filament through, snipped it off flush at the extruder, extruded 100 millimeters, measured it, made sure I was getting 100. I was, so it was perfect. After that, I took a look at loading my filament. I just wanted to give you a quick look. This is inland filament. Uh, I get it from Micro Center. I usually have really, really good success with it, but this spool and spools in general lately from inland I've seen have been wound pretty sloppily. Uh, take a look at the filament. Make sure it's wound properly. I, I can already see it's not knotted here, but it's certainly not tightly wound. So I'm going to keep an eye on this filament as it's printing. After that, it's time to load the filament and we're going to do a quick bed level with a print. So I use Sprayway glass cleaner on my glass uh, in order to clean my fingerprints and everything I've done on it. And then I love using a glue stick. So glue on glass, great thing. I don't use it on the bed level at first, but whenever I'm going to do prints on glass, I will use glue. You have to make sure, of course, your bed is level, everything's calibrated properly. You don't want to use glue as a clutch, a crutch rather. You want to make sure it's just another tool in your arsenal. So the bed leveling I use is a 20 millimeter cube and it's 0.2 layer height. Whatever your layer height is, is one layer high. And I put it in all four corners and then I check and I run a skirt around it. So that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a skirt and I'm rolling my finger over the outside of the skirt to see if it's grabbing my, my build plate. And if it's not, it means that I'm not properly leveled. After doing this twice, I realized I wasn't leveled. So I went back, I rechecked it and sure enough, my bed was significantly warped. Uh, the nozzle was touching the corners of each bed perfectly leveled. And then when I rolled my build plate to the center, there was a generous gap there. I would say two, two and a half millimeters. It was really significant. Now, I'm not sure if this came from the factory. I almost doubt it. I have a feeling it was the way I was manipulating my build plate when I was putting my bed springs on. I had to tighten down some of the rotary knobs um, with a wrench. And I think I might have just been a little too aggressive, a little too ham-fisted. And I might have done the, the warping myself. Either way, at this point, I was kind of in a pickle. I didn't know what to do. I knew there was like some old wives' tale about shimming your bed with tinfoil. I thought it was just complete fiction, but I tried it, and I got to tell you, it worked. I didn't think it was, so this is a picture of it. I, my, my foil shims really don't look that good. I took about four sheets of aluminum foil. I folded them over a couple different times. I put them where that warpage was, which was basically the center of the bed. And after I put my glass bed on top, sure enough, it, it my bed was able to be leveled. So it did work. I'm going to run back through. I'm going to make my tinfoil look a little nicer, and I'm going to try it again. But as far as I can see, this is going to work. It's going to conduct heat. Here's a re-level. The same print. It's four 20 millimeter squares in each corner, and then the skirt going around it. And as you can see, I'm feeling that skirt with my finger. I'm rolling it over the, uh, the bead of print that's going on the glass bed, and it's not moving. That means it's adhering nicely. That means it's all level. After that, I check the squares that are being printed. If they're a little off, I'll adjust my knobs. I'll re-love my bed. I like to check that middle one because obviously there's really no adjustment you can do. And that middle one came out phenomenally. So I checked the top corner. It looks good. The fourth one printed and it looked awesome. This bed was nice and level so we can start printing. First print I do after doing all this is a flow test. I want to see if my flow is right. I do a, uh, a two line cube. I have a video on this. This is my same video, E-step video. And this flow cube came out perfectly, 0 0.8 on all sides. So I knew my flow was dialed in appropriately. There was some pitting in my cube though. So I thought temperature was the next thing I should check. I did a temperature tower. Sure enough, I was about 20 degrees too high. I was printing at 205, but this really wanted 185. After the temperature was done, I wanted to check out a bench sheet, make sure everything was in order. And this bench sheet came out very, very nicely. So the next thing I wanted to do, I knew eventually I wanted to do helmets. I know I wanted my helmets to be tree supported. So I want to do a model that I could tree support. Generally what I use is a baby Yoda model uh, that can be found on Thingiverse. I'm going to link it in the comments. I sink that model down about 13 millimeters, I believe, to take the base off it, and then I tree support it. Really good calibration print. It's an intricate model, 
and it tree supports well. So I can tell two things, the kind of detail I'm going to get, and I'm going to tell how well my tree supports are working, how well they come off. So this is that Baby Yoda model, tree supported, all finished. Um, again, glue on glass. It is glued down, but it came, it looked really nice. So you can see those tree supports are kind of just peeling right off. One of the supports is under Yoda's hand, so I know I can't take it fully off until he's off the build plate. I then use one of these uh, sticker scrapers you'd see maybe in the mechanic station to kind of just ease them off. And then after that, I can pull that final piece of support off, and he looked really good. A couple little weird artifacts, but other than that, really, really nice. Detailed, and this tree supports came off well. So after that, I really didn't run into any problems. I figured, let's try a helmet. So I tried the helmet, three days, 17 hours, tree supported, no supports in the center, and this was the final result. You see I'm going along the edges again of that helmet with the with that window scraper. And all I'm doing is I'm just lifting up the, the edges here because I know once I get them all up, I'm going to be able to take this thing off. I'm not being aggressive with this, being very gentle. Um, but this, this helmet, just from looking at it here, I was impressed already. And these tree supports were already kind of coming off the build plate nicely. So I was, I was definitely hopeful. And like I said, I don't have supports under the dome of, of the helmet. So really the supports that you see are the only ones in there. There's really no one in here of the helmet. And that was it. It came right off the build plate very easily. Uh, supports intact. And now I went to the task of snapping those supports off. And they, they really detached very easily. I was obviously being very gentle with this after a three plus day, almost four day print. You don't want to be too uh, aggressive. And I'm just popping, popping, popping rather my finger through those supports. I'm able to just take them off very easily. Everything came off. I mean, look at that. And look at the detail underneath. I was really impressed. I got to say, even looking at this now, I'm still impressed. And this support came off all in one piece. Again, this is Cura tree supports. So I did no magic here. Cura did all the magic. All I did was tree supported. I blocked out the top layer of the dome because I, I know it can print uh, domes like that fine. And sure enough, it did. So there it is, that fin is off, and now we're looking at the final product. As I said, there was no supports on the interior of that helmet over by like the scalp, the top of your head area, and that's fine. It's going to look a little cruddy up there, but you're gonna put foam up there, you're not gonna worry. And this is the final result, wow. Breathtaking, really. If you could see it in person, you'll see barely even layer lines present, a little bit of Z seam, but you're gonna get that. A small bit of post-processing, and this is gonna look spectacular. So I was blown away, I was really impressed by this. So there we have it, folks. We unboxed it, we assembled it, we did some calibration prints, and then we shot for the target we were aiming, and we hit it, first try by the way, a one-piece helmet built all on a single build platform. Really amazing. Now, for the price, being able to get this build volume at this performance, I was really blown away. Now, will this happen all the time? Absolutely it will. I'm a great printer. I'm joking, of course. No, of course not. You're going to have trials, you're going to have tribulations, adhesion issues, warping, the electric might go out. You'll get a spool uh, tangle. So many problems can happen. But what this does prove is this printer can accomplish big prints like this and at very high quality. Now, how did we get there? Well, we didn't do much. We assembled it. We made sure certain things were calibrated appropriately. Then we did some prints. We calibrated our flow. We did our temperature. Then we went to an actual calibration print to check everything. Adhesion, layer lines. That was the Benchy. It worked out very well. Then we tried something more intricate. We wanted to see how those tree supports would work. We did Baby Yoda. He came out surprisingly well. So you know what? We threw the helmet at it. Sure enough, three days, 17 hours later, we pried this thing off the build plate. The supports fell off like butter, and there it was. Voila, we hit our mark. So if you made it this far, I really appreciate it. Thank you for watching. If you're looking for a big volume printer, 310, 310, 400, I can show you what I've done so far. Only five prints through it. Of course, I don't have the longevity of experience. But right now, I would definitely recommend at least giving this a try. So if you like what we're doing, if you want to see more of these type of videos, hit the subscribe button. I always appreciate that. If you like it, you can hit the like button. Any comments, any questions, anything you want to see me do, see me improve, uh, leave a comment down there. I love answering anything like that. And of course, ladies, gentlemen, everyone else, until next time, keep on printing.